This is David Rawlings. He is a master of swordsmanship and weapon arts with over 25 years experience and is the founder of the London Longsword Academy. Today he's looking at some of the weapons and fighting styles from the brutal battles of Chivalry 2. Historically we actually have the use of this kind of weapon as a way of stopping people getting through entrance ways and genuinely trying to stop people from getting onto a boat. So I do like the, within <laughs> in Chivalry that you get so many kind of like incidental melee weapons that you can pick up that are fundamentally useless and really, really don't do anything other than give you a little bit of a like, I have a chair, that's really useful. I highly recommend checking out the London Longsword Academy. All their links and information will be in the description. But without further ado, let's see what a Swordmaster makes of Chivalry 2. I like it's got all the, all the important yelling and screaming. In general, I really like the combat in Chivalry because it's melee and there's not so much value in taking these really broad swings when you've got loads of your mates and you are just hitting each other left, right and centre. So you start learning the value of these downward blows. I think when you're dealing with something like this hammer where you've got both the hammer and the beak of the weapon, you could look at the potential of maybe being able to sort of like hook the corners of shields or pull them forward or this kind of thing or even hook legs but again i understand the complexities in trying to animate this but they could be nice little touches obviously just battering someone with it very very cool it's not going to look very much different to this it might be kind of nice to see potential for the puncturing um, effect of these things particularly where it's going into kind of like male gaps and things like that it might be almost nice to have the effect of not necessarily going through the armor but glancing off the armor denting the armor and then actually breaking in through one of the gaps in where the chain is or something like that it's getting a nice little spike in here so there's things that i can see cosmetically that would be more difficult and i think would make the um the survivability of characters too great in this so I think it's a good balance between bludgeoning the shite out of and finding the weak spots. Finding the weak spots would be a little bit nicer, but still, still very, very cool. So the falchion in this is very, very interesting. I think it's a little bit more of a starter to my eye. Something still has the capacity for cut and thrust, and that'll vary. The one that we seem to have in this, you might be surprised. Sometimes they're not as heavy as you might imagine. They can still be quite light. They can still be quite nimble. On the other hand, they can be absolutely beasty weapons. If you think you've taken the mass of a big sword and kind of compacted it down into something. So you've still got quite a lot of metal. But like I say, that can be deceptive. They can still feel very, very light and maneuverable but being excessively good cutters. Something like this, now this is not that, this is a falchion which is just horribly, horribly nasty and incredibly, incredibly good in the cut. This is a horrible beast of a weapon, but it still has the capacity to thrust. And I think this is something that chivalry has done very, very well is that they've maintained the idea that you can thrust with pretty much anything, even if it's not so efficient in the thrust. So this should be a good combination cut and thrust weapon. Again, it's really gonna have the same problems against heavy armor that is not particularly well designed to go against plate, for example, but it is still going to be relatively efficient going in through the gaps. This one seems to have a little bit of a spike. So here you have a nice point, which is still gonna go through gaps and it hopefully is still gonna go through little gaps in the chain and that kind of thing. So the falchion fight is really, really cool. Not so much because of the falchion, but the really interesting thing about this is really the use of the great sword of Montante, the Spadone, being used to stop someone get onto a boat. And historically, we actually have the use of this kind of weapon as a way of stopping people getting through entrance ways, through narrow paths, and genuinely trying to stop people from getting onto a boat. So maybe then trying to get up the gangplank, maybe then trying to get through the two rows between the oarsmen, this kind of thing, depending on the circumstance. So different ways of using them. If you've got people to either side of you with oars, you need to basically keep yourself as much forwards as possible so that there's not this right swinging. If you're on a narrow thing with nothing to either side, but none of your own people you can hit, then you can swing at this with clearance if the other person, as in this case, has got a shorter weapon than you. You have a lot of extra reach. They're going to have to work really hard to get through it and they're going to get hit on the back swing or the forward swing. So for the protecting a narrow area, that was a really, really interesting fight. The guy actually was genuinely trying to stay quite in the line and I liked that. Very, very cool. I 
I do like the, within <laughs> in chivalry that you get so many kind of like incidental melee weapons that you can pick up that are fundamentally useless and really, really don't do anything other than give you a little bit of a like, I have a chair, that's really useful. They have full armor, the chair is completely ineffective. Oh, I'm dead. I think that's a really nice touch. Obviously, you need a frying pan of invincibility because that should be in every game. <laughs> When you get to any axe in combat, the real big issue that you're going to have again is when we're dealing with the amount of armor that people are wearing, the type of armor that people are wearing. Really, it'd be nice to see something where quite often in this, you'll hit, see something hit the back. And I think you see in the, in the clip, you see the axe hit the back and it looks like it hit straight into the armor and there's still loads and loads of blood. And I think this would be one of the nice things to see is that the armor in itself is much more efficient at stopping bladed weapons and that you've really got to go for the bits which are not using huge amounts of plate. So if you've got a decent breastplate, that's got every potential to stop this weapon. It's not your good use. Swinging it horizontally into the torso, not a good use. Swinging at the arms, good use. Face, good use. Anything that's exposed really. So it's not so much a critique of the weapon, but it kind of feels like the opponents in this are still able to be injured in places where they're exceptionally covered by very, very good armor. So I'd like to see the attacks being more isolated to places that don't have good protection. Great swords, five handers. So much to unpack with these things. They can be used by long swords, primarily in treaties that refer to things like the Montante and Spadoni. They're really not being used in exactly the same way. But then you get these little giveaway sentences that say they should be. So it's probably down to our training that we are doing them wrong as humorous. And I started trying to adjust my training to reflect the fact that they are just swords and we should be using them like swords. So there's a few other things to look at. First of all, the rings. Everybody always has a little bit of a fascination with the rings on a spy hand or a beaten hander. And really what I want you to look at is the idea that they are nothing more. They're not to be grabbed hold of really to hold it like a chainsaw. This is complete nonsense. Really, they are just a way of stopping your fingers from getting impacted. So very often in long sword fighting, for example, you will find that if you're holding the sword with any normal grip, your hand resting about here, your knuckles will still get hit. And that's really it, it's as simple as that. You put a big ring on that and it stops your knuckles from getting hit in these incidental strikes. So it is just hand protection, really that simple. The other thing is really the lugs that are further up the blade, the little hooks. Again, I'd look at that as an extrapolation of this principle, which is they kind of take the place of the rings that you'd have on a complex side sword, for example. So they're rings to stop something from impacting down on those bigger sets of rings. So in this case, you have something that stops the blade from sliding down and then potentially hitting onto those rings or, or missing those rings because quite frequently, if you're holding a sword and you've got rings, something impacts and it still manages to hit your knuckles. So if you have something here or here that stops the blade from sliding down your blade, you have that additional protection. <laughs> Quite often you do see these, okay? You do see people doing this either defensively or to attack. People will grab hold of really, really sharp knives. And again, hands are relatively survivable. You'd much rather you lose the use of your hand and still be able to live than you would to do anything else. Now, if you think if you've got a weapon at the same time, as Tebow says, if someone grabs hold of your blade, they've got the power of your life in their hands because they still have a free hand with the sword. In this case, you're basically benefiting from the leverage from the fact that you can oppose your opponent's blade. Running at someone doing this, you can, but you've shortened your weapon, so it's whether it's that much use to you. But certainly, if we come from here and we've gone around the opponent's blade, if you imagine pivoting around their blade like this, then gripping, stopping their blade from coming back towards us by dominating with this double hand position, then shunting, this makes a lot more sense. So absolutely, it's a thing you do. Where you do it, I would suggest, is more of the issue in the game.
Long sword, just look at it as weapon in two hands. And again, all of the things apply, how much mass there is, the construction of the blade, whether it's more of a diamond section, whether it's designed more for cutting. So the profile of the blade is going to be important, but really, I don't think there's anything you can add for a long sword that can't be said about the Montante or the Spadone or the Spinehander Beadenhander, for example. Half sword, absolutely fine. Its capability to cut or thrust is going to be somewhat dictated by the profile of the blade. Its use against weapon, against armor is likewise going to be influenced by that. So if you're wanting to jimmy it into the spaces in armor, then that's going to want to have more of a diamond section, for example, just to keep the rigidity in the blade. <laughs> The other thing, of course, is then the murder stroke, okay? Which is where you hold the sword like this. Now, this is not a great weapon for doing this with. I do apologize. It's very, 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 very flat. But holding it by the other end and booping somebody with it a bit like a pickaxe, that's a thing. When they say stab them with, with the pointy end, they mean this is a big weapon. What can I do with all of it? Now, one of the things I suggest about this idea of using the weapon um, more or less like a pickaxe, where you're kind of like you're hurling the weapon and you're hitting them with either the pommel or the crossguard, is not that it's necessarily the thing you're going to do as your first thing, but if you've used, say you've gone to the half sword position like this, and having done something and moving their sword out of the way, the next most convenient piece to use is this end then that's the perfect place for you to do so. So you may have thrown somebody's sword out of the way, and then the next thing for you to do is to smash them with the other end to hit them like so. So it's more of a case of, rather than being necessarily your initial design, it's the prudent and most efficient use of your weapon from the position you're in. And why disadvantage yourself by going, well, you can't do that. So I think we, what we have to look at is there is a point where we will do it because it is the most easy and quickest way to dispatch our opponent. Not that we're going to gear our way through the fighting game. At some point, I'm going to do something really sneaky and turn around and hit him with the other end. That will surprise him. No, really, this end of it's it's now the simplest and most efficient way for me to kill them. It's a pole arm. Pole arms basically are going to come down to what you put on the end of them. So those lugs might be to stop something move, they, moving down the blade. They may be to give you the capacity to parry briefly as you go through, because parrying with the head of the weapon is very, very much a thing. You certainly see this in Halberd, and it really comes down to has the weapon got something which can briefly interrupt something if you point your point towards it? This is kind of an underexplored or under known element of parrying that people don't often think about. Sometimes we'll parry not by putting the broad and the strong of the weapon in the way of the blow, but by pointing at the sword. And what this means is that you confront it with a lot less energy and you absorb the blow by first of all pointing and then sort of absorbing the structure into yourself. Now, that's not as esoteric as it sounds. It just means that you're not confronting something directly. You're just taking it here. Now, if you have something like a spear, you're much more likely to be able to confront something with a point, but without so much force. So you're more likely to gather the weapon somewhat like so. So having lugs on the weapon might be to stop an opponent getting down it. It might be just to prevent it from sliding down while you're going through this motion and allowing yourself to get some form of parrying action as you go through that. <laughs> If you'd like to see more of David as well as other martial and medieval style episodes, make sure to like the video and let us know in the comments. We have another video on chivalry featuring David coming soon, so be sure to subscribe for that. And if you want to see more of the London Longsword Academy, you can check out some of their videos as well as all their links in the description below. Thanks for watching.